Good evening and welcome to Newsnight. On Newsnight tonight, minority accused government of sinking Ghana further into debt distress as parliament is asked to approve a fresh $250 million loan. This actually goes to the heart of almost every problem we have currently as a country, over borrowing. When we have borrowed up to our neck, we can't pay. We are going around the world begging everybody to forgive us our loans. At the same time, we are borrowing more. We'll let you in on the debate as government seeks again to grant 12.7 million euros in tax waivers to a company for electrification of 205 communities. Also this evening, the West Africa Examination Council considers recruiting its own invigilators following arrest of 16 GES teachers for various infractions in the ongoing BEC. Um, teachers are supposed to be among the, the uh, trusted people, people with integrity in our society. So when your partners are letting you down this way, it is really, really worrying. And going forward, maybe recruit our own invigilators. Also tonight, Bato chiefs unconvinced about measures in place to avert another disaster after a stakeholder engagement between the VRA and key st stakeholders in six main areas likely to be affected by a possible spillage of the Akonsombo Dam this year. Yes, we are not certified about the whole thing because we are not expecting our people to turn to beggars again because Ghanaians are tired of giving food items to us. Four individuals cleared by the NPP Vetting Committee for Mesha South NPP Parliamentary Race. Clearly tells you it is not a family stool. If it's a family stool, it would have been my family members making that determination. So on Sunday, delegates, I uh, come to you, do me the good honors by awarding me the winner after um, 1 p.m. In business, government to seek review of international ruling on utilization of some oil fields in Ghana. And Bato Senior High School celebrates victory over St. Catherine Girls and Sokode SHTS Big as the win qualifies them to national championship of the NSMQ for the first time. Twitter competitions was tough, especially the true and false, oh my god! But they kill it! They kill it! It's not excited. And much later, England takes on Netherlands, who makes it to the finals uh, to join Spain out there. We have Euros. Uh, we have um, commentary coming up much later. Details of that and more after the break. Thanks for staying with us here on Newsnight. You're on Joy 99.7 FM. We're live in Kumasi on Love 99.5 FM. Also, my joyonline.com and X Spaces. Your comments are welcome. Is via WhatsApp 055 11 We start off from Parliament. And a minority in Parliament say they cannot understand how government will be asking the House to approve $250 million at a time when it is asking its debtors to forgive or postpone the repayment of debts. According to former majority leader, Osei Chiemen Sabonsu, the loan is for the Ghana Financial Stability Project. Listen. $250 million facility is a financing agreement between the government of Ghana and the IDA, the International Development Association of the World Bank Group. And Speaker, it is for Ghana's financial stability project. The speaker, it's a critical note in the um, restructuring that government has embarked on. And that agreement, the discussion with the World Bank IMF group, preparatory to where we are today, was really it was, <laughs> it was got, so it was part of the uh, discourse that we engaged in. So that is what we're supposed to do, to create, to solidify the platform for us. Mr. Got, thank you very much. Well, the minority side have been criticizing this attempt to borrow more. Listen to the minority whip, Governor Kwame Abuja. This actually goes to the heart of almost every problem we have currently as a country, over borrowing. When we have borrowed up to our neck, we can't pay. We are going around the world begging everybody to forgive us our loans. At the same time, we are borrowing more. We have gone everywhere. China was last week borrowing, telling China that forgive us part of what we, we borrowed. And then on Wednesday morning, you are borrowing more. How do you, how do you solve your borrowing problem by borrowing more? I don't get it. And I'm saying that the finance minister better answer that question. Don't take that responsibility because it's a dangerous trap for you. 
In fact, once upon a time, you presented a budget year. That year was better. The year that the finance minister came, things went bad. But they could have made you a finance minister. They refused not to. Uh, they, they refused to make you a finance minister. Don't take up the responsibility of borrowing extra money to, I mean, help the economy. Well, former minority leader also uh, was on his feet, Harry Idris, when his warning that the continuous borrowing of government may be breaching the IMF deal currently being implemented. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Minister for Parliamentary Affairs is invited to lay a financing agreement of a loan of up to 250 million US dollars for the Ghana Financial Stability Project for and on behalf of the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I will know whether he is aware that Ghana, as part of its agreement with the IMF, between now and even end of 2025, cannot borrow more than 250 million US dollars non-concessionary loan. So if he's laying this, what he needs to clarify is whether maybe this came earlier before part of the creditors' agreement the minister reached last week with the IMF. Ghana, from now, even for 2025, maximum, Ghana can only borrow non-concessionary up to 250 million US dollars. Then 500 million US dollars into 2026 and it's elevated into 2027. So if you want to cover the whole envelope of 250 with this uh, uh, instrument, what he needs to clarify is by his knowledge whether this is a concessionary or a non-concessionary facility and why he wants to lay it. So that's um, the former minority minority leader, Harry Nigeria. So there, let me bring in uh, my colleague, Kweku Asante. He's been monitoring this for us and other happenings in Parliament. So Kweku, despite these concerns that were raised, we are also told that 300 million worth of tax waivers locked up at the Finance Committee. And there are new requests. What exactly are the details? Yes, about 12.757 million euros in new tax waivers is being requested by the Finance Committee. This will be referred to the Finance Committee. And if you look at the other paper, it says that this is required for the importation by the Energy Ministry, as well as Messrs. Tenga Ship Ghana Limited, for the electrification of 205 communities in Upper East Region under the National Electrification Scheme and the Self-Help Electrification Program. So government says the tax levers that are being blocked in the committee, they still have a couple more, and in particular this one, 12.75 million euros. That is expected to electrify about 205 communities. That has also been referred. And the minority have still made that their insistence know that they do not believe that this is the time new loans and tax waivers must be coming in. This is the time government must be modest. Government must be cutting its expenditure and all these things to save the nation a lot of resources and not continue to resort to borrowing. There are even MPs who make the comparison that if you convert 12.75 million euros to Ghana cities, you are, you, are, you are headed into more than 200 million Ghana cities when government needs to set similar funds and they are raising all that value. I wonder then what the conclusion then on the matter was. Well, the Speaker of Parliament did allow these two um, financing agreements as well as the request for waiver of import duties and um, taxes to go to the Finance Committee. It is now up to the Finance Committee to work on it and present a report whether or not they will be recommending for the House an approval or not. But... Clearly, from the minority stance on this, they are really going to prepare themselves for battle. Some of them even referencing the $115 million loan they approved quite recently for the Greater Accra Resilience Project, saying that the government was just simply spending those amount of money without investing them in places that will really be productive and give the country an ability to pay those money. So we expect that probably by the end of this session of parliament, that committee report will come and then the House will take a vote. And just before you stepped out of um, the chamber, um, something has come up again, this issue about the IGP, uh, the leak tape. There was an order from the Speaker earlier. It's come back. Tell us more. Yes, Senator, you will recall that last week, Speaker of Parliament, Alban Bagri, ruled that the, uh, the, the committee that was tasked to do this work, Atatia, James Agaga, Peter Lanchini, Tobo and Co., had not completed their job. Because on the floor, all of them had specific disagreement in terms of how the committee should have gone by it. And so the Speaker of Parliament ruled that they should go back and do their work and present a report. 
But today, the Speaker of Parliament has decided that the report should be taken and that House should continue from where they left off. So he gave the opportunity to Samuel Atatia to be on the floor and continue to advance his argument. Atatia has been making two arguments. He says first that it has come to the attention of the committee when they were doing their work that the recording that has gone public may not have been completely recorded by Chief Bugri Nabu and that one ASP Asante, who is alleged to be a boy of the IGP, may have been the one who orchestrated the recording. He says the committee decided that they wanted to invite this ASP Asante to come before the committee and provide answers. But again, the three minority MPs on the committee, led by James Agaga, they blocked that testimony and did not allow that to happen. And so these two issues, one, whether or not Bugri Nabu did record the issue, the, the tape, or this tape was recorded at the instance of the IDP, allegedly, he wanted to get into it, the minority would not allow that, and that is why he's supposed to it. And then secondly, both Chief Bugri Nabu and the IDP, or when they appear before the committee in the public hearing, did indicate that they had not spoken to each other in about eight months, at the time the committee did hear the testimony of those two persons. But he says someone did come forward to the committee that the claims made by both the IGP and Chief Bugri Nabu were not true, and that those two persons had indeed spoken quite recently, and not the eight months that he claimed. He said that bordered on perjury, for which reason they wanted to invite this person who said he had evidence that both the IGP and Chief Bugri Nabu had indeed spoken, not eight months as they claimed, but quite recently. But then again, James Agaga, Peter Lantini Tobu, and Eric Opoku, who were the minority members of the committee, but became the majority on the committee, did block that testimony. While he was making this argument, the majority leader, Alexander Pedro Markin, walked in and raised the preliminary objection. You will recall that when this report was laid, it was laid by Kennedy as upon chairman of the Defense and Interior Committee. It was not part of this committee, but at the time, the majority chief with Frank Arnold and did seek permission from the speaker, then Andrew Marcos Yama presided, to lay this report on behalf of Atatia. At the time, he did say that he was laying this report with the consent and knowledge of Samuel Atatia. Afenio Markin now says the Speaker of Parliament has to rule whether or not this report was properly laid as it was not laid by the chairman of the committee. But James Agaga has had a rebuttal saying that at the time he was on the floor ready to lay this report, it was just the leadership that decided that Kennedy and Japan should do this. So the House is currently having a back and forth. The Speaker of Parliament says he wants to be guided we want to hear differing opinions on whether or not the report was properly made, and then he will make his opinion. What this will mean is that this goes to the heart of the report itself. If the report the Speaker is to hold that was not properly made, it means then there's nothing before Parliament and all the argument would have to go and start from scratch. If he does rule that the report was properly made, despite not having been laid by the Chairman, then a committee report will continue. So that is the back and forth on the report now before the Speaker will make a ruling. Again, we are not clear whether or not the Speaker of Parliament will make a ruling right now, or as he usually does, he wants the, he wants the House to wait for a day or two so that he can prepare a reasoned ruling. Anyway. Well, that's uh, my colleague, Quick Quastante there, and the action is happening live now. Uh, we can let you in on excerpts of that debate. Chief, in the Bougri, had said that he did it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And, and currently speaking, the is the chairman of, of the committee uh, that was put together to investigate this IGP leak tape, Samuel Atachia. We can listen. He didn't, I mean, put the gadget together. Somebody did it for him. Is that so? So if it is said that it is the IGP's man, a gentleman called um, um, ASP Kenneth Asante, who did the taping, it was a position that that would change the entire investigation. So that it will come to the point of saying that this tape has been improvised by the IGP himself. But Chief Bugra Nabu said some people were trying to show their concerns about elections and how it is possible that the IGP could change um, the electoral fortunes of some party and some people can break, cannot break the age of the RGP is there, and it was going to take, tape, uh, take the tape to the president so that he will listen to it himself. As it happened, um, there was a pointer to that. I was hugely surprised that anybody would say that there is a voice on the tape, and that individual whose voice was on the tape should never be called. 
Well, so that's um, Samuel Latachia, the, the chairman of the committee, was on his feet. So after that, we've had the vice chair of that committee also, who is a ranking member on the Defence and Interior Committee of Parliament, James Agauga. The issues about whether that report should have been laid by him, amongst others, came up. And this is what he had to say. I was in the House. I drew the attention of leadership to the fact that the report was ready for laying. And in fact, I was ready and willing to lay it. However, the majority chief whip took the decision that once the chairman for the Defense and Interior Committee had earlier laid a report for that particular committee, he be called upon to lay the report for and on behalf of the chairman of the special committee. But Mr. Speaker, we need to take note of something here. The, the, the report in question was not the chairman's report. It was the committee's report. The ad hoc committee so that in the event that the chairman was unwilling to lay the report, permission could be sought by the leader for a member to lay the report for and on behalf of the committee. That was my understanding. The practice of this House is that even in cases where ministers of truth, just today, today, leave was sought for the Minister for Parliamentary Affairs to lay papers and reports for and on behalf of the Minister for Finance in this House. It's a practice. I don't think there is anything uh, very bad about uh, uh, such a practice. In any case, Mr. Speaker, we now operate under the ages of the new rules. And that day, James Agaga, mm -hmm. who is the vice chair of that uh, committee that was set up to probe that uh, leaked tape. Uh, and this is still continuing on the floor. And you see there that a lot more MPs are beginning to uh, proffer their own opinion on this particular subject. We wait to see how the speaker will rule and how mm -hmm. they can proceed on this very controversial uh, matter. Uh, you want to follow us on myjoyonline.com for the very latest on this uh, controversy that the members of parliament are currently debating. But let's uh, turn attention now to what is happening with the BECE because the West Africa Examination Council is contemplating hiring its own invigilators after 16 GS teachers who were supervising the basic education certificate examination were arrested for various infractions just three days into the exams, escalating more practice practices in previous years pushed WIAG to implement stricter monitoring mechanisms leading to the swift apprehension of these corporates who have since been handed over to the police. And my colleague, my missing Yamisha Thompson, breaks down the figures. According to WIAG, 16 invigilators and teachers have been apprehended for various breaches. The centres they were arrested at include Save Our Souls Educational Centre, Bekwai. Their three teachers were picked up for trying to assist the candidates. Also at Jenny Jenny Senior High School Centre, two invigilators were apprehended for taking snapshots of the English language question papers and posting them on a WhatsApp platform named Kurasuma JHS. Now in Kranza Senior High School, an invigilator, Abiyam Danso, was arrested with a mobile phone on which were answers to the religious and moral education questions. At Chemu Senior High School, Tema, a teacher, Amwako Joseph, was arrested for taking pictures of the question papers and posting on a platform named Apo Lord for BEC 2024. At Liberty Hill School Center, an invigilator, Farore Patrick, was arrested for taking pictures of the science paper and handed over to the police. At Jache Pramsu Senior High School Center in the Ashanti region, an invigilator, Danso Emmanuel, had a phone on him in the examination hall while Mensa Emmanuel had pieces of paper on which were answers to the questions of the English language paper. Now, Santo Basic School Center teachers from Desvi International School were found on the school bus solving the science questions for onward transmission to their students in the examination hall. All these people, they say, have been reported to the police and are being processed for court.
Well, we can now also hear from the head of WAEC in the Ashanti region, Divine Wolanyo. He describes how two teachers were caught in the act. This teacher had met the private schools and had charged them 6,000 cities. And so immediately we asked for the removal of that teacher. He had another accomplice. She also was removed. There was an issue. You had the town phone coming, trooping in. That happened to be an open center. Open in the center is no wall. So that center has been changed, has been moved. So they are moving to a place that is well, more secure, so that the town folks will not have access to the... Nothing will happen to the candidates who are writing the exam. So when they go, they should stay off the school campus. We have asked for police reinforcement. If they get arrested, they shouldn't blame anyone. They are intruded. They are not supposed to be at the center. If you were, are not part of the examination official, you are not expected to be at the center. So that's um, the Waiek Ashanti region head, Divine Wolanyo, um, describing to us how some of the teachers were caught in the act. And let's uh, bring in John Kapi, the head of public affairs at Waiek, uh, joins us right now. And, and Kapi, have you made more arrests? Uh, yes, we thank you very much. Uh, good evening to your listeners. Uh, yes, we have made uh, two more arrests uh, in the central region. We are yet to get the uh, our monitors to give us details of these people, and then we can put that uh, in the public domain. This brings the number to eighteen. Yes, that's that's what it is. Yeah. Is this unprecedented? Um, you could say so because in previous years we actually did not register this number. Now, previously, we got uh, hints that these things were on, uh, going on at the uh, examination centers. We decided this time around to send a warning and also to increase our presence around uh, the examination centers. Probably that is the reason we've been able to apprehend this number within a short uh, period of time. This must alarm you and understand that you've met the GES on this. How did that go? Well, uh, the, the, uh, there was uh, a call or uh, meeting between the head of office and the director of general Ghana education service, um, and he was of the opinion that once any of these people had breached the rules of the examination, the law should take its course. So I believe that at least we are on the same page as far as maintaining sanity at the centers is concerned. Uh, beyond that, we are going to uh, prepare a list of these people who have uh, breached the rules and then present them to the uh, Ghana Education Service for further disciplinary action because uh, GES is a professional institution that takes care of the teachers. And you've told us that, why, because of what you're now witnessing, you've been, you're now considering hiring your own invigilators for future exams? Yeah, these are issues that have come up. Again, I've always told the media that uh, all of these plans have financial implications. So um, if we are going to be assured of funds, why not? We'll be able to recruit our own uh, invigilators, train them very well. And so we'll be able to take swift action whenever we find anybody, you know, going contrary to the rules that we have set for the examination. And you then going to impose stricter measures if you have the funds. Does this suggest that GES in recruiting these invigilators is not being strict enough in the clearance process and the way that people are selected and vetted? Yeah, you know, we the, uh, the partnership between us and GES indicates that the GES will provide for us Providers and invigilators, and they would do the other technical bit of it, preparing the questions and then sending them to examination centers. But as we are observing, a lot of these teachers probably either they've not been screened or not been briefed properly or are simply being dishonest. But then we believe that they are not up to the task. And so, if there's an opportunity, why not? We should be able to recruit our own uh, invigilators and supervisors. And stay with me, Kofi Asari is executive director of the Africa Education World. Kofi, so what you're hearing here, you hear the John Kapi says, well, it sounds unprecedented, but they've put in place stricter mechanisms now, and so he's finding out these uh, invigilators who have been uh, attempting to corrupt the process. What's your own reading of what is happening now? 
Hello, Kofi. Okay, uh, we don't have Kofi on the line right now. We'll try and get him back. But I have with me uh, Jacob Anaba. He's a vice president of the National okay, Association of Graduate Teachers. Hello, Jacob. Can you hear me, Jacob? Very well, I can. Great. Jacob, um, are some of your own members... Uh, Kofi, just a second. Uh, Jacob, are some of your own members invigilators in the ongoing BC? Uh, good evening, uh, Evans, and uh, good evening to your listeners. Of course, uh, we have members across the levels of uh, the pre-tertiary education, so we we'll have some to be our members. I do not know the those who are involved presently, so I cannot tell whether we have our members. But we have our members at all the levels, so mm. it's possible. This must alarm you to hear that only in three days, eighteen invigilators teachers have been have been apprehended. It's, it's it's worrying. It's, it's it's really disturbing. Um, <laughs> one will wonder why a teacher will go to a length of uh, trying to um, help the students in the classroom when they are writing their exams. The teacher work stops when the students enter the classroom to take the exams, and that is when you measure your output, the work you've done over the years. If you follow the students into the classroom to teach them. Pass the exam, then how do you measure what you have thought over the years? It means you have failed as a teacher. I don't know what the motivation is. Uh, if it is for money, then it is very uh, shameful. Because I don't know how much these students could contribute to give to a teacher to change your fortune. Uh, if it is for fame, uh, I, I doubt if you get that fame through helping the student to pass exam because at the end of the day, when they go higher, they will find out and uh, they cannot continue. So th there is no motivation for a teacher to be um, involved in uh, exam at practice. We always admonish our, our teachers not to take part in those activities uh, so that, I mean, the profession will remain um, the way we want it to be. I mean, obviously, it's, it's, that, that admonition isn't working, is it? I mean, it, it, as we wait to establish whether these individuals have been arrested, are your members or not, teachers are involved in this nonetheless. Uh, what is it that your organization, NAGRAD, plan to do if it's indeed established that these 18 uh, teachers include some of your members? Yes, of course. The law must take its course. Uh, uh, if you agree to take part in the examination, then you have a contract with the GES as a, a, an invigilator. And the, the contract has its uh, terms and conditions, and you must be ready to face them. So the law must take its course. But at, your, at the end of recruitment, and you say what you do is to admonish them, that is not enough, is it? It's a proper screening needs yeah. to happen. Uh, proper yeah, vetting we, of these you individuals. Know, we, we are not involved in the examination. It is GES that recruits the teachers. And the GES must ensure that they recruit the best. Like he said, they must be screened. When you go to the schools, you ask the headmasters um, for the teachers that you can rely on. I'm sure we'll get them. And GES must be ready to pay um, money that is commensurate with the work, so that teachers will not be motivated to to be involved in this man practice that we see during examination. So we must be <laughs> realistic with how we give to the teachers when they invigilate. I mean, Kofi sorry, you've just had the the bedding shifted onto the GES to do a bit more proper screening and vetting. <laughs> From where you sit and the way you study what happens with the recruitment process, what has gone wrong here? Uh, apologies there. A uh, terrible connection uh, to one of the uh, guests on the line. Hello, Kofi Asari, can you hear me? Okay, we may have lost Kofi there. Uh, John Kapi, uh, you've met with the GS already. We've handed over the 18 uh, suspects to the police. Hasn't this affected the integrity? of the ongoing exams? Well, um, for now, we cannot tell because at the time these people were apprehended, we could not tell uh, the spread of whatever it is that they had on them. What, what we can do would be that for now, we have a record of all the areas where these people were picked up. And so when we are doing the marking 
would scrutinize and, uh, you know, find out whether there has been any form of collusion, uh, you know, because obviously when these things are brought into the candidates, they copy word for word. All the mistakes are the same. All the correctness of the response are the same. So then we are, you know, convinced that indeed something, you know, went wrong at the center. So for now, we we'll allow the candidates to go on and then wait until it's time for marking for us to ascertain whether indeed uh, they benefited from these things or not. Kofi, this is a crisis, is it not? What must happen now? Well, as we keep saying, um, you can't do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. That's all I have to say. We know what to do. What must we do? We have been recommended to government since 2020 that insofar as teachers who teach students are in regulators, are supervisors, there is no way you can end examination room collusion or any form of examination of practice in the room because the main profiteers from that business are the same teachers who are in regulators or teachers who are supervisors. And that is the first step in curbing examination room collusion. Why is suggesting that they may be forced to recruit their own invigilators? Would you support that? So that was that was on page nine of our WASI 2022 report, and in, in our WASI 2024 report, we recommended that we've had discussions with the ministry, with Parliament, with WIAC, all the stakeholders, and we emphasize that. The issue is that I see WIAC to be willing to do that, but the resources available to WIAC by um, from government it doesn't support that because, as I said, WIAC you know, engaged, engaged teachers to do the regulation because um, the financing regime supports that. You know, they can owe government staff, you know, than owe private staff for that long. And also the inadequate the amount is not too much. And so if you're engaging government staff already paid by government, you know, something small at the top up may be appreciated compared to engaging a private security firm. But if we really want to solve this problem, we must rise above the budgetary issues and look at the effectiveness and efficiency in engaging external um, agencies, including private security, because they know that once they don't conform, their contract will be cancelled. I'm talking about the private security companies. And so it's about government uh, rising up to the challenge resource wide to decisively deal with examination and collusion. But as it stands now, what we are reporting is not news. It goes on every day. It's just that the news is that people have been caught. But in terms of the act, act it, is, it is regular. It is not an exception. Thank you very much, Kofi Asari, Executive Director of the Africa Education Watch. Jacob Anaba is the Vice President of NAGRAT and John Kapi, Head of Public Affairs at WIAC. And uh, you have your children right in WIAC at all? No, please. Uh, any WIAC exams? They, they are not, not older DC. and younger. What about the WASI? Older and younger. Okay. Yeah. But they will write? <laughs> no, not Older yet. and younger. Older and younger. Will, will, the, will the younger write? <laughs> or will, will older is Sometimes obviously... Sometimes to come, I'm sure they would have fixed everything. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, but but we all remember writing BC. Um, I didn't. I didn't remember. I don't recall encountering any teacher assisting me. And I think you know, I, I just wrote my own exams there. Did you? When you wrote BC, yeah, you had any teacher helping you? <laughs> not at all. Not at all. I mean, at that yeah. time, I mean, just to quote uh, the submission by my colleague in the newsroom, uh, Lawrence. I mean, he was talking about how the teachers were at that time very strict on the students. You know. And so I don't know whether it's happened. I remember an incident at the SS level when they had to do oral English, and uh, some people didn't hear Professor Dolphin's uh, pronunciation well, and it was a mass. But uh, the evangelist said, you know, we are going to go ahead. Mm. So, uh, and they're charging huge sums, 6,000 CDs. Definitely the parents are paying. Um, the kids can raise 6,000 CDs, although we've heard that some of the children are also doing susu, yeah. you know, to pay. Mostly, we heard from Kapi last week that they found a platform where the parents actually are also come to, they're coming together but now to, to come. Just like what the Nagrat official said, this thing has always been there. Maybe we are now reporting more on it in mm. terms of cheating. Maybe the skill, it's now worrying. You know, there are instances where there's even a leak before the day and you go into the room and the exact questions mm. are there. Well, we've heard from uh, YX say that they've now zoned the areas where they picked up the, these teachers and they'll be scrutinizing the papers once they receive it to see if uh, they see a trend because they repeat the mistakes even in, in, that, in that case. So and that then say, becomes an issue. The boy 
is that coming? You had a boy. Is that Everybody coming? in that room yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, you know it was an issue. Uh, George, what do you have in the headlines? Well, the coming up government to seek review of international arbitration ruling on unitonization of some oil fields in the country. And food prices hit record highs for last month, according to the Ghana State School Service, despite inflation slowing to hit 22 Point eight percent. The business news on Newsnight is brought to you by MTN Business. Welcome to the new world of business, kingdom books and stationery, Synthes Tanks and the Pepsident Herbal and Charcoal. You welcome back to Business on Newsnight. Now, government has revealed that it would move to review ruling halting utilization of some oil fields in the country. An international court has ruled to stop government from forcing two oil firms, exploration firms, that is ENI and Vitor, from utilizing the operations with another oil field operated by Springfield. Now, Minister of State Designator, the Energy Minister Herbert Kramper, disclosed this during his veteran Parliament Appointment Committee. I believe what this, this award does uh, is to signal the, to the government to, to cure the anomaly which has been pointed out and the government's policy of unitizing uh, the blocks. We can go ahead with it and ensure that we, we develop both blocks, um, bring out our hydrocarbon resources for the benefit of the Ghanaian people. Um, the good news is that the, the claim that was being made, 7 billion US dollars, uh, that was being made on the government, uh, the, the, the panel finds that government doesn't have to pay any of that at all. The panel found GMPC not to be liable in any way whatsoever uh, in what, what transpired. We reserve the right under our laws to unitize blocks that we believe straddle and don't have to be developed independently. And I believe that the ministry would, would, would do a review uh, together with the Attorney General's office and will be advised accordingly on what the next step should be. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Minister of State Designate at the Energy Ministry, Herbert Krapper. Now, food prices hit record highs from May to June this year. Now, this is despite inflation rate slowing to 22.8%, according to data released by the Ghana Statistical Service in the crowd today. There is more in this report. The Ghana Statistical Service data showed in April 2024, food inflation stood at 22.6%. However, it's jumped to 24%, representing a 5% leap over a month that is from April to May 2024. It is not clear for now what were the main drivers, but a careful look at the numbers showed alcoholic beverages, tobacco and narcotics recorded the highest inflation rate increase compared to June 2023. Also vegetables, tubers, plantains, cooking oil and banana. Another category of food which also went up was ready-made foods. For instance, Fresh Okru saw the biggest jump in price going up by almost 90%. It was followed by green pepper which also went up by 71%, while tomatoes shot up by more than 60%. Another interesting development from the Ghana Statistical Service data was that inflation rate for locally produced items was far higher than the imported items. The non-food inflation slowed marginally, however it is not clear how that might have contributed to the slowdown in inflation. And that is a business tax report. Meanwhile, government statistician Professor Samar Kobnenim has been downplaying current market development as a major contributor to the slowdown inflation rate for the month of June. Slowdown that we're recording for year-on-year -year inflation for June 2024 is to a very large extent as a result of what happened last year and should not be related to the fact that prices of goods and services in current period are going down. Clearly, from the month-on-month -month inflation, it tells you that both from a food inflation and a non-food inflation, prices of goods and services are going up. So we need to have that clarity with the interpretation. So the, the slowdown of 0.3 percentage point from both a year-on-year -year basis and a month-on-month -month basis is strictly as a result of the significant increases in consumer price index as we saw between May and June um, 2023. The question on the effect of exchange rate is always, always an important um, one, and that is why we've provided a trend analysis from June 2023 to June 2024. Government statistician Professor Samuel Kobner in. 
Now, General Manager for Venture Capital Trust, Provincial of Free Ampoma, is making a strong case for reassessment of venture capital practices in Ghana. This, he says, will aid the attraction of more international investors to support small businesses across the country. He spoke to Joy Business at the Capacity Building Workshop in Accra. We have a peculiar problem in venture capital practice, which is uh, the limited liability company or the company structure we have under the Companies Act has significant challenges when you want to implement the venture capital model. We've done it in the, you know, we've managed it, it's, it's working a little bit, but we can do better. Uh, international investors are looking for a model that they are familiar with. And because of that, and also the challenges that come with it, we have identified that we need to reform Ghana's legal regime when it comes to forming legal structures. And I'm talking companies or limited liability partnership and so on. Venture capital is at the head uh, trying to come up with the Limited Partnership Act. We've started work on it already and um, very soon uh, if, if everything goes well we hope that the, the parliament will be able to see it our way and pass the relevant laws to ensure that we have a limited partnership act and a limited partnership structure. Percival Lofurie Ampoma is general manager for Venture Capital Trust Fund. Now, managers of the Caritas Lottery Platform, a subsidiary of the National Two Authority, is rallying more Ghanaians to participate in promotions to help mobilize more revenue for the state to aid development. Now, speaking at the launch of the Telesell More Money promo in Accra, marketing manager of Caritas, a platform that has been at Buama, assured that proceeds from such promotions will help in developing deprived communities and also key sectors of the economy. So that partnership with Telesell reward Ghanaians more cash prices, including a grand prize of one million Ghana cities. We want to let Ghanaians know that partnering with Telesell, whatever revenue that accrues on the Caritas Lottery platform doesn't sit with the authority. It goes to our various communities or societies to put smiles on the faces of people. So we want to urge Ghanaians to participate because indirectly, once you play the promo or you participate in this, you are indirectly putting a smile in the face of someone in a remote community, providing portable water, paying someone's school fees, providing health care, supporting the and culture of Ghana. Uh, that is the manager at uh, the Caritas uh, Lottery Platform subsidiary of the National Lottery Authority there. That is uh, Bernard Buama speaking. Let's turn attention to the stock market and if you are a shareholder in MTN, it was up by peso to close at one Ghana City 91 pesos. And that's all uh, for business on Newsnight. And what's your money on? Netherlands or England? Ah, the soft spot is for England because we okay. wanted to come home. We have commentary um, coming up um, shortly, but uh, let me quickly take you to the Ashanti region and four hopeful candidates who appeared before the new patriotic party's vetting committee for scrutiny ahead of the party's internal election for the main Shia South parliamentary seat having cleared for the contest. My colleague Nana Bwachi Adam has more in this report. On Monday, the New Patriotic Party opened nominations for the Mencia South Parliamentary race scheduled for Sunday. At the close of submission yesterday, four persons had submitted their forms, including the brother of the incumbent Member of Parliament, Dr. Matthew Pokoprempe, who is known as Nana Ousu Efriye. Today, these four persons faced the NPP's vetting committee and were cleared. The vetting committee has issued a strong warning to these individuals to be cautious of the utterances during their campaign. We've advised the candidate that they can ask their followers to campaign for them. But we don't want to see them following the candidates around. It's a different way of campaigning. It may answer the same, but... Uh, it will avoid a number of issues because we don't want a situation when somebody will even go and make a statement. You know, we have very short time to even deal with the conflict resolution. So it is, we need that to take all the precautions to ensure that we, we come through this process in a very peaceful manner. Evan Sinemako, the director of elections for the New Patriotic Party, says measures are being put in place to ensure a free and fair elections. Well, these are in-house arrangements and so the delegate list has been given to uh, all the candidates. We expect the constituency executives, electoral coordinators, 
polling station executives uh, to respect the rules and regulations as well as the candidates that they must not be seen to be campaigning for any of the delegates and uh, the new patriotic party as usual will uh, consult with the Electoral Commission and Ghana Police Service to ensure that we have a successful uh, constituency delegate conference. These aspirants vying to replace the incumbent member of parliament, Dr. Matthew Pukprempe, are poised for victory. His brother, Nana Ousu Efriye, says he's ready to take over from Dr. Matthew Pukprempe. I'm well prepared because I've been involved with the constituency since. So I think among the people who are contesting, I'm the most qualified in terms of service in the constituency. It's not a family stool. I think if it's just to be a family stool, I wouldn't have come here. I'm putting myself up for the delegates to make a decision. So that clearly tells you it is not a family stool. If it's a family stool, it should have been my family members making that determination. But this one is a family stool in relation to MPP. So the family of MPP within the constituency are the one to decide who to. And I believe I'm a royal of the MPP family in Manchester South. So I qualify to contest. ASEO, where ASEO means victory. So on Sunday, delegates, I uh, come to you, do me the good honors by awarding me the winner after um, 1 p.m. At the end of the day, the new patriotic party concluded the vetting process and conducted the balloting. These aspirants are ready for Sunday. For Joy News, my name is Anabwa Chitankwayado. Kumasi. And that's how we end um, tonight's edition of News Night. Evans, we are getting ready for England and Netherlands. That's a big game. Are they going home? They are coming home. Or they are coming home. Yeah, it bringing is it, it home. Is it coming home? Or coming they are going home. home? No, they are not going home. It's coming home. <laughs> okay, we'll see. Isaac Musbao and the team are ready. We are going out, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I mean, you're going out with MFA Pau. Uh, He's going out, Obi. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, that's it. That's the, the team there, Evans, Mensa, and MFA Power. Coming up is the big.